The fourth to eighth week of gestation is also called the embryonic period. During this period, the major changes taking place are folding of the embryo, that is, the flat embryonic disc undergoes folding, thus changes its body form to acquire the external features of the human form. Second major change is differentiation of the three germ layers into various tissues and organs. Formation of the primordia of organs systems. Thus, by the end of the eighth week internally, most of the organ systems have started developing or formed. However, their functions may be negligible. Therefore, this embryonic period is also called as the period of organogenesis. The first major change during this period is folding. In the third week, the embryo was in the form of a flat trilaminar germ disc. However, with the multiplication of cells and formation of various tissues and organs, especially in the central part of the germ disc, the head and tail ends of the disc remain close together and the disc starts bulging upwards into the amniotic cavity. This results in a cephalocaudal folding of the disc in the median plane with formation of the head fold and the tail folds. At the same time, due to rapid growth of somites, there is also folding in a transverse plane with formation of two lateral folds. Thus, four folds are formed. The cephalocaudal folding in the median plane through the head and tail folds and the transverse folding through the two lateral folds. All the four folds converge on the ventral aspect of the embryo, thus converting the flat embryonic disc into a cylindrical embryo. The effects of folding result in the formation of two important structures, the primitive gut tube and the definitive yolk sac. As a result of the folding, a large part of the yolk sac is incorporated into the embryo proper, thus forming an endoderm line tube which is known as the primitive gut. The extra embryonic part of the yolk sac now becomes small and inconspicuous. This is now called the definitive yolk sac or the umbilical vesicle. The primitive gut and the yolk sac now communicate through a narrow structure which is known as the vitello-intestinal duct or the vitelline duct, also called the umphalomesentric duct. The primitive gut tube, which gives rise to most of the gastrointestinal tract, can be subdivided into three parts based on its relation to the vitelline duct. The foregut is the part of the primitive tube which lies cranial to the communication with vitelline duct. Midgut lies opposite to the vitelline duct and the hindgut is the part of the gut tube which is caudal to the vitelline duct. Folding also leads to changes in the position of the connecting stalk and the amniotic cavity. The unsplit part of the extra embryonic mesoderm formed the connecting stalk. With formation of the precaudal plate and primitive streak, that is determination of the cephalocaudal axis, the connecting stalk moves towards the tail end of the embryonic disc. Now further, with the folding of the disc, it moves to the ventral aspect of the embryo. With folding, the amniotic cavity also expands greatly and surrounds the embryo on all sides. Thus, at this stage now, the embryo floats in the amniotic fluid. The embryo is now enclosed on all sides with the ectoderm and amnion except on the ventral surface. This is where the four folds meet leaving a small circular opening which is now called the umbilical opening. And the structures which pass through the umbilical opening are surrounded by a tube of amnion and amniotic fluid. These together constitute the umbilical cord. 
The folding also affects the relative positions of various structures of the embryo. To understand these changes, let us first recollect the position of structures before folding. From cranial to caudal, the cranial most structure is the septum transversum which is formed by the unsplit part of the intraembryonic mesoderm. Just behind it lies the intraembryonic coelom which will form the pericardial cavity and in its floor lies the cardiogenic area. Behind it lies the precaudal plate which is now called the buccopharyngeal membrane. In the midline lies the notochord and dorsal to it lies the neural tube. Caudal to the neural tube and the notochord lie the primitive node and the primitive streak. And caudal to that another area thin membrane called the cloacal membrane. And caudal most is now the connecting stalk with the allantoic diverticulum. As a result of folding now the cranial most structure is the cranial end of the neural tube which enlarges to form the brain. Whereas the caudal most structure is the cloacal membrane which now faces slightly ventrally and the surface depression is called the proctodium. The endodermal line tube which is formed is called the primitive gut. Dorsal to this primitive gut tube lies the notochord and the neural tube and at the caudal end of it lies the regressing primitive node and primitive streak. Ventral to the primitive gut from cranial to caudal we have the buccopharyngeal membrane which is formed from the precaudal plate. The surface depression here is called the stomatodium. Just caudal to the buccopharyngeal membrane lies the developing heart tube and the pericardium. Thus, the buccopharyngeal membrane and stomatodium lie in between the bulge of the developing brain cranially and the bulge of the developing heart caudally. Caudal to the heart tube lies the septum transversum which was the most cranial structure in the embryonic disc. Later, this is going to give rise to the diaphragm and the liver. And just caudal to the septum transversum lies the connecting stalk and the allantoic diverticulum which now lie on the ventral surface of the embryo. The second major change during embryonic period is the differentiation of the three germ layers to form various tissues. The ectoderm which surrounds the embryo and its derivatives are the protective epidermis of skin, epithelium of the oral and anal canals, the neuroectoderm which forms the neural tube and neural crest cells will give rise to the nervous system, cornea, lens of eye, muscles of iris and the adrenal medulla. Endoderm forms the gut tube and its derivatives are the epithelium of the gastrointestinal, respiratory and urinary tracts, the glands that is liver, pancreas, thyroid, parathyroid and thymus. Mesodermal derivatives are mainly musculoskeletal and connective tissue that is dermis of skin, muscular and skeletal system, parts of the genitourinary system, adrenal cortex and the body cavities. An important structure formed during this period is the umbilical cord. It is a tubular cord-like structure made up of a tube of amnion and the structures present within it. These are the vitello-intestinal duct and remnants of the yolk sac, the extra embryonic mesoderm of the connecting stalk which forms the protective Wharton's jelly, extra embryonic coelom and the allantoic diverticulum, the umbilical vessels that is the right and left umbilical arteries and the left umbilical vein. The right umbilical vein disappears and the left is left. The umbilical cord is approximately 50 centimeters long and allows the free movement of the embryo. If the umbilical cord is too long or too short, it may cause problems during childbirth. 
Too long an umbilical cord may encircle the neck of the fetus leading to fetal distress and too short a cord may cause difficulty during childbirth by pulling the placenta. Another condition associated with the umbilical cord is the physiological umbilical hernia which normally occurs due to the herniation of the midgut loop into the proximal part of the umbilical cord during 6th to 10th week of intrauterine life. This is due to a small abdominal cavity. Sometimes this may persist even after birth, leading to a condition known as the congenital umbilical hernia. Let us recollect the stages of the formation of the yolk sac. Around the 9th to 10th day of development, the blastocyst cavity forms the primary yolk sac which is lined by the cuboidal hypoblasts and the flattened cells of the user's membrane. Around the end of the second week, due to formation of the extra embryonic mesoderm and the extra embryonic coelom, the yolk sac becomes small and is now lined by cuboidal cells, hence called the secondary yolk sac. During the fourth week of development, as a result of folding, a part of the yolk sac becomes enclosed in the embryo proper forming the primitive gut and the small extra embryonic part of the yolk sac is now called the definitive yolk sac. This further undergoes an hourglass contraction to form a small umbilical vesicle which communicates with the midgut through a narrow tube called the vitello-intestinal duct. The functions of the yolk sac are mainly hemopoiesis, that is, it produces blood cells up to sixth week of intrauterine life. It also helps in the formation of the primitive gut. The primordial germ cells which develop in the wall of the yolk sac later migrate during the fourth week to form the gonads, that is the ovary and the testes. It also forms a small diverticulum which extends into the connecting stalk called the allantoic diverticulum or the allantois. This later forms the urinary bladder. The amniotic cavity expands to surround the whole embryo. It ensheats the umbilical cord and also covers the fetal surface of the placenta. As a result of this, the extra embryonic coelom gets obliterated and the two fetal membranes, that is amnion and chorion, fuse with each other. The amniotic cavity is filled with a fluid called the amniotic fluid or the liquor amnia or camerous fluid. It has a protective function and acts as a shock absorber, also allowing free fetal movements. It provides nutrition to the neuroectoderm as it passes through the neural tube. Also swallowed by the fetus, it passes through the gut and is absorbed into the fetal blood. The fetus excretes its urine into the amniotic fluid. The abnormalities associated with amniotic fluid are increased levels of amniotic fluid that is more than 2 liters is called hydroamnios or polyhydroamnios and this is associated with esophageal atresia. Decreased levels of amniotic fluid is known as oligohydroamnios and this is associated with renal agenesis. Prenatal tests are done during pregnancy to detect birth defects, genetic diseases and other problems. Amniocentesis is a procedure through which 20 ml of amniotic fluid is collected under ultrasound guidance. It is usually performed between 15th to 20th week of intrauterine life. Chorionic villus biopsy. Chorionic villus tissue is collected under ultrasound guidance from the placenta where it attaches to the uterine wall, usually done between 9th to 12th week of intrauterine life. During these procedures, either the biochemical parameters like alpha fetoprotein levels or the cells can be assessed for chromosomal anomalies. Cord blood. 
The cord blood is a source of stem cells which can be stored in banks and used to treat various disorders. Amniotic bands. These are tears of amnion which may result in amniotic bands which may encircle fetal parts leading to congenital malformations. When a mother gives birth to two or more offsprings in a single pregnancy, it is called multiple births. When two offspring are born, they are called twins and the process is called twinning. It can be three called triplets or four called quadruplets. With assisted reproductive techniques, the incidence of multiple births is increasing. The types of twins according to their genetic relationship are dizygotic or fraternal or non-identical twins, monozygotic or maternal or identical twins. The dizygotic twins are produced by fertilization of two different ova by two different sperms. They are phenotypically and genotypically different, may have different gender also. They therefore have two different gestational sacs and their own amniotic cavities. They are called bicorial and biamniotic. The monozygotic twins are produced by fertilization of a single ovum by a single sperm thus producing a single zygote. They are phenotypically and genotypically similar hence called identical twins. The monozygotic twins can be classified depending upon the time of separation into if the separation takes place up to the third day after fertilization that is during the phase of early blastomere then they have two different chorionic cavities two different placenta and two different amniotic sacs hence called bicorial and biamniotic if the separation takes place between the fourth to seventh day of development that is by duplication of the inner cell mass in this case they have a common placenta and a common chorionic cavity. However, they may have two different amniotic sacs, hence called monochorial and biamniotic. If the separation takes place at approximately the ninth day, that is by duplication of the embryonic disc, they have a common placenta and a common amniotic cavity hence called monochorial and monoamniotic. In case the separation occurs after 12 days of fertilization, the twins may have joined bodies. Then they are called conjoint twins or Siamese twins. Based on the site and extent of fusion, they can be craniopagus that is fusion of the heads, thoracopagus that is fusion of the thoracic wall, Pyopagus, fusion of the sacral region, or cephalothoracopagus, that is, fusion of the head and the upper thoracic wall. Thank you for a patient listening.